tonight, what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that I've been working on for a long time uh, and thinking through in both individually and collectively. So I uh, serve as the national director of an organization called BYP 100. And that stands for Black Youth Project 100. And if you have been paying attention at all to what has been happening in Chicago in the past couple of years, you've probably heard of us. Maybe. Hopefully. You heard of us in the context of being some of the most badass young people leaders in this city, right? And maybe in the, in the country, right? <laughs> so that's basically what I get to do every day. I get to work with young black folks who are committed to black liberation. And what that means is something different in how we all articulate it, but at its core, it's about being able to live within our full dignity as human beings, right? And that for that to not be dictated by any structure or institution or by the government. And Rosa Frie, who's here, is a founding member of BYP 100. Uh, and so she's a technologist, right, and co-founder of Emory Leaf. Um, and at, how, since the very beginning of BYP, one, of BYP 100, we've always been concerned with grassroots organizing, with strategic communications, and technology, and how you integrate all those things into building political power for black people, right? And so I came into BYP 100 after, I don't know, about a decade of doing movement building work across the country and connecting with people across the world. I might look like I'm 19, but I'm actually 32. <laughs> and uh, BYP 100 is actually celebrating our fifth year anniversary this year. We've been around for five. Can I get like a clap or something? A finger snap? Something. It's hard for us to start organizations and build them, right? And it's been a rough. It's 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 been a rough five years. A five years of uh, resilience. It's a lot of. And so, actually, I'm going to go to this slide first. Um, raise your hand if you know who this person is on the screen. So uh, that is a, a depiction of Trayvon Martin, who would have turned 23 years old this month. It's bittersweet, but actually, he was killed by George Zimmerman a day ago, I think yesterday. Uh, was, anniversary seems like an odd word to use, but it marks um, the date that he was killed uh, by a self-appointed vigilante in, his na in a neighborhood in Florida, in Sanford, Florida. And how I'm connected to Trayvon Martin begins with the Dream Defenders, which is an organization based in Florida who focus on uh, building statewide power um, but led by young people, black, brown, indigenous folks, all kinds of folks from uh, across the state of Florida. And they were a part, they were the group that led the march from Miami to Sanford, Florida after Trayvon Martin was killed, right, in uh, 2012. And that's where I entered and where I first like, really learned about Trayvon and got involved in the work is when the Dream Defenders was developing as an organization. A year later, I'm with Rose Afrié and a group of 100 black activists had been invited to attend a convening by Dr. Kathy Cohen, who's a political scientist at the University of Chicago. And at that convening, we learned that Saturday night that the verdict in the killing of Trayvon Martin would be announced. And I feel that that night is like the, where were you when uh, Kennedy was shot kind of night. Where were you when we found the, out the George Zimmerman verdict? Where were you the night that they rolled tanks into Ferguson, Missouri? Where were you those nights? And so those are the nights when I think about the formative years, uh, just and these, all these things just happened in the past six years. And so it was out of that moment that we decided to start an organization, out of a, a realization. And oddly enough, it was the exact same night that Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal Tometi launched Black Lives Matter as a hashtag. It was the same night in two different parts of the country, right? And so how we deepened our work was then, we were also very clear that the ways in which state violence and state-sanctioned violence function in the United States is, impacts many types of black people, right? So Sandra Bland, how many know, how many people know of Sandra Bland, know anything about her story? Great. For those of you who don't know, Sandra Bland 
is from a community right outside of Chicago. She was on her way down. I heard somebody say they got a new job. Shout out to you for your new job, <laughs> whoever that was, <laughs> right? Sandra Bland was on her way to a new job, right, in Texas. And she was pulled over by a police officer. Anyone remember what she was pulled over for? Close. It was something stupid, for sure. Yes, failing to signal. Raise your hand if you've ever failed to signal <laughs> while driving. I probably did it on the way here. Actually, I did. Somebody almost cursed me out um, <laughs> driving over here, right? But none of us, because by virtue of the fact that you're sitting in this room, have been arrested, taken to a jail, and found dead several days later. And regardless as to what we believe is the cause of Sandra Bland's death in that jail cell, because she died, she was found dead with a plastic bag wrapped around her neck. They said she hung herself. Regardless as to what you believe happened in that jail cell, the state is responsible for what happened to her. Because technically, once you're in police custody, they're responsible for your livelihood. And we are told that police are here to what? Keep us safe. And so in BYP 100 and my work and the organizations that we work with, we're very clear that the ways in which policing impacts black people in this world is not gendered alone, right? We know the stories, and we should know the stories of Trayvon Martin, and we should know the stories of people like Sandra Bland. And to go one step further, how many people in this room know about C.C. McDonald? And I want to note that the numbers of hands that have gone up have drastically decreased with each person. And I'm so excited that I actually get to talk about these people with you. If you've never heard of Cece McDonald, she is one of the most prolific organizers in this country. Right now. And she's from Chicago. <laughs> I'd love to, love to claim her. Cece McDonald was in Minneapolis. Um, the years are failing me right now. This was several years ago. And uh, she was in Minneapolis leaving a bar with her friends. And a man walked up to her and her group of friends and started to yell out racist, homophobic, and transphobic slurs. All right? And physically assaulted, like physically assaulted people. And in response, in defense of herself, the man who attacked both verbally and physically the group of people was killed. C.C. McDonald was sentenced with a long prison, prison term. And C.C. McDonald is a black trans woman. When she was incarcerated, she was placed into men's prisons. Two, she was placed into men's facilities. And C.C. McDonald is an abolitionist. And what do I mean by that? She doesn't believe that prisons should exist, right? And that alternatives need to be built to deal with conflict and harm and violence. C.C. McDonald, while she was incarcerated, fought for her freedom in collaboration with people who, uh, a movement community across the U.S., right? And she intentionally did not demand to be placed into a women's prison because she said prisons aren't safe for anybody. Because she understood that if she was put in a women's prison, her safety was not guaranteed. I was reading an article two days ago maybe 4 a.m., I was up, I can't sleep, I'm an I have horrible sleeping patterns. And there's an article about Albert Woodfox. He uh, is one of the three men called the Angola Three who spent 41 years in solitary confinement in Angola prison in Louisiana and was recently released a couple years ago. While he was incarcerated, they formed a Black Panther Party, the only one to my knowledge that was recognized in a prison in the U.S. And they had to form an anti-rape committee in the prison because it was deeply unsafe for all the men and the people who were in that prison. And y'all, this was 40 years ago, over 40 years ago when they started this. So the connections, the decades, the decades uh, in this country in which people like actually experience incarceration and what we fight for is what our work is about. Our work is about saying actually, yes, Know about Trayvon Martin, and let's go wider and deeper about how these things are impacting our people. And in many ways, I think that's a part of the magic that is BYP 100, and a part of the magic that is the movement for black lives, is that we have a very, despite what Oprah says, 
we have a very clear understanding of leadership. We have a very clear understanding of what we want. If you want to know what we want, if you're like, yo, these, I don't know what the hell these people want, what they're asking for, what their demands are, you can visit agenda to build black futures.org. You can visit um, uh, vision for black, the Vision for Black Lives on the Movement for Black Lives website. We have developed several policy platforms, y'all, several visions, agendas. There are campaigns happening all across the world. The work for the people in this room that I implore you to do is if you are not already engaged in supporting the Movement for Black Lives, is to get engaged. Every single person in this room has a contribution to make. Every time, and I wonder if it's at the bottom of the list of questions, what should white people do? So I'm going to preempt that question right now. <laughs> what can white people do to support the movement? Oh. So <laughs> it always comes up. How am I doing on time? You're doing great. OK. So one, come to things like this to learn from people who you may or may not agree with, to sharpen your analysis, steel sharpen steel. Right? You have questions about things. You don't know what the hell we mean by prison abolition. Read Prisons Are Obsolete by Angela Davis is one option. I can talk about more things that you can read and watch to understand some of the things that we talk about and that we, we are demanding through our work and also creating through our work. So it's really important to be in spaces. And who was the person who said they were nervous or like worried about what was going to happen tonight? I was really excited about that. That was me who said yes. Be OK with being uncomfortable. Because if you are comfortable in conversations about death and violence, that's a problem. It's OK with being un uncomfortable is being OK. It it's OK to be uncomfortable. Because that's actually like my job as an organizer, sort of like the, wa the, the, the spin cycle in the washing machine, right? The agitator. Agitates, right? It allows you to, to, to get out the water, the things that you no longer need. It's a process. And sometimes you got to go through two spin cycles, right? Some of us got to go through three spin cycles <laughs> before we get out what doesn't serve us any, any longer, right? Organizing and the work that we do is about being engaged in a long-term struggle. So as white people and other people of color in this room who are not black, committing yourself to actually engaging in supporting groups that are uh, actively fighting for collective liberation. So that means that some of these skills that you have, uh, BYP 100 has all kinds of tech needs. And I'm not going to miss this opportunity to say that we're looking to build an internet system. If that is a skill that you have, and we're not looking for you to do it for free. We have money. <laughs> but we are looking for someone to help us with that. We're, we lo we're looking to build an internet so we can better engage our members, our base, so we can better communicate with each other. That's not what I have skills in. I can develop a strategy. I can organize a direct action, but I cannot develop an intranet system, right? And there are all other types of skills if you're doing civic tech hacking in this space that can actually lend to black-led organizations and make that a priority. Not just social justice organizations, the black-led organizations. If you look around at your dev boot camp, or you look around at any of these leadership development opportunities or skills opportunities and you don't see any black women in the room, that's a problem. You don't see any black trans folks in the room, that's a problem. How are you investing in black people and black leadership in the work that you do, right? I think we're much further along with talking about more women in the workplace. That's cool. That's great. But as black people, we sit at many intersections. I'm black. I'm a woman. I'm from the south side of Chicago. I attended public schools all my life. I then went to private colleges, graduate school, all that good stuff. But I never visited the University of Chicago my entire childhood. And I grew up less than 10 minutes away from the institution. So it's our duty as people in this room who are professionals and you're invested in civic tech to not just say we're going to support people of color. We're going to support social justice, but to intentionally engage with black folks and not be afraid to do so. And then, of course, your coins, <laughs> your coins, your money. We need your money, too. We'll take that. <laughs> Donate to our organizations. Donate to our movements, right? Um, and if it's not out of your pocket directly, well, it should be out of your pocket directly, too. 
your organizations. I remember one year, uh, a bunch of uh, staffers at Google um, did a, a whole fundraiser for us. Um, and they solicited um, donations from staff uh, at the, the headquarters. So it's like things like that that people have done, and people continue to make investments out of the tech, the tech space in movement, and I implore people um, to continue to do that. Data for Black Lives, there are a bunch of different places where people can plug in if you're not black, okay? I promise. How much more time do I have? Two minutes? Okay, what do I want to do in two minutes? First, Rose told me to make sure to talk about transformative leadership development. So I'm going to talk about transformative leadership development. I have witnessed firsthand the miracle of organizing. I've literally seen a young person come into a BYP 100 chapter. One person in particular, she's a leader here in Chicago, her name is Janae Bonsu, came into our chapter, had no organizing experience. From becoming a member, she then became the chapter organizing co-chair. From there, she became the co-chair of the chapter. From there, she became our national public policy chair. From there, she's now a national leader in the movement for black lives. It took us some years to get there. <laughs> but when we think about the fact that, as Ella Baker said, Martin Luther King Jr. didn't make the movement, the movement made him. The movement for black lives is a movement full of leaders. We don't have one single leader. I actually don't get to call all the shots in BYP 100, believe it or not, I actually don't. I have a whole team of people who help to make those decisions. Is it a flat structure? No. No, it's not a flat structure, but it's a clear decision-making structure that's actually an invitation for people to be involved in the process. It's one that actually demands that Charlene Carruthers is not the only person who can speak on behalf of BYP 100. I'm not. But it's one that also says we're actually going to spend the time to develop leaders that say, I don't actually have to be there in order for our organization to strive and to thrive. Because if you look around and your team doesn't, like if you miss a week with your team and they're unfunction, they're, they can't function, then there's a problem. What's the leadership development pipeline? How are we investing in people to come up after us to take on this work? Who the hell is going to lead Shy Hack Night when y'all are done? Right? Who's going who's gonna to lead it when you're done? So we all, we all have a role in cultivating leaders to make sure that our work continues. Because if you are here in this room, my guess is that you're invested in building tech that actually supports the common good or the social good or the broader community. Yeah? That's my guess. It's why you're in this room, because you care about that. And so it's our duty as people who care about something, who care about something to make sure that we're helping to develop the people who come up after us, to not only care about it, to always continuously be in a process of making things better than what we even imagined they could be. I have been in this movement work now for 14 years, and I have learned a lot. I'm also a huge history nerd. Like I, I geek out on history, I love it. And so I wrote a book, it comes out on August 28th, you can pre-order it now. If you're like, I don't buy stuff from Amazon, you can go to palsbooks.com <laughs> or IndieBound, and you can purchase the book there. If you're like, OK, I need my book to come on time or something like that, you can order it from Barnes & Noble, right? And if you're cool with Amazon, you know, and you weren't cool with the mayor putting the city of Chicago on the, the slab to just give everything out for nothing, you can order from Amazon.com as well. So, <laughs> oh, and they will be in libraries. Yes, they're not, I mean, it'll be in libraries after it comes out, of course. But yeah, thank you. What are your next steps, and what are next steps that us in the audience can take? You, mm -hmm. you touched on that second bit, yeah. but what are your next steps? Oh, my next steps. So, um, I'm deeply invested in leadership development. I can talk about it all day. It's something that, it's the thing I care most about, is like actually making sure that we have people who have this, both the skills and like the understanding or analysis of the world that we live in in order to continue the work and to do the work. I don't think that young people are the future. They're like right now, like it's happening right now. And that um, <laughs> for me, it will always be about supporting that. I, my hope is that with this book, Unapologetic, is that I will have the opportunity to continue to make interventions 
in the broader space about what our movement is about, what's important, and also what activists can actually do. Like, what are the practical things that you can do to sharpen yourself as an activist or an organizer or even a scholar, right? Because those three things can be the same, but they're also three distinctive things, activism, organizing, and the intellectual work of, of being a scholar or an intellectual. Uh, here in Chicago, we are working on several campaigns. One, we're calling for a community benefits agreement for the Obama Library. There was actually a vigil earlier at the public meeting, and the community benefits agreement is about saying, hey, all of this money is going to be invested in this library, so we need to ensure that the community actually benefits and is not torn apart, but is actually made stronger by the building of this library. Because if you don't know, you should know that once someone puts a multi-million dollar um, building in any community, particularly in a black community um, where they are planning to build it, it impacts the entire economy in that area. It means that some of y'all might be more interested in buying a house in that area. But maybe last year you weren't interested. So why is that? And what is the impact of a bunch of white folks moving to Woodlawn and Jackson Park going to have in the neighborhood? Right? Or how is the library going to add building it and the, the economy around it actually going to focus on making sure that people from the community and the city are hired? Making sure that infrastructure investments are made in the area that benefits the people who already live there. So that's one thing. The other thing we're fighting to uh, ensure that the $95 million, 85 or 95, I already, always get the number, is it $95 million? Uh, slated to build a new academy for the Chicago Police Department is not built. So we're in, in both the, the Community Benefits Agreement and the No Cop Academy. Those are both coalitions um, that we are a part of, uh, organizations like Asada's Daughters, and a whole group of people are leading that coalition to stop the Cop Academy from being built. We're calling for the Cop Academy to not be built and for that money to be invested in our public schools. If you don't know, in one, one single year, 51 public schools were closed in the city of Chicago, and 97% of those students affected were black students, right? And that was just a couple of years ago. So those are two campaigns that we're working on right here in Chicago, and you can support us. Um, one, I would love to connect anyone who's like, ooh, maybe I'm working on a project, or what projects are you all working on that we could support? I'm happy. We have people on staff who specialize on our digital operations um, that I could connect you with directly. And then also you can become a sustaining donor of our organization at byp100.org, byp100.org. Um, so you use uh, like just a couple of like data statistics recently uh, to make some arguments. I'm kind of curious because you know we're data nerds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that we thought, I, I've worked on a lot is projects that try to use data to make a persuasive argument. And I've seen projects that we've built, like Chicago's Million Dollar Blocks. Like yeah. sometimes that's used by people, and it like has a good effect. And I've seen people use it actually to make the opposite argument that we wanted to make. So I kind of wanted to get your perspective on, like when you, I, when, if and when, and how you use data to make your arguments when you're actually trying to convince someone uh, that you're right. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. So data is not neutral. It's not politically neutral. It's not value neutral. It's not. They may teach you that in the academy, that data is neutral, but it is not. Like, these things are to be interpreted. Information without context can be used in any kind of way. And it's like our work to actually take the information that exists and to place it into context so that it can actually be used for the greater good, right? And so that's my first part of the response to how we should be even engaging with data. And not saying this is neutral or it's just out there. I love listening to NPR. That's what I have on in my car all the time. I will sit in the car longer just to hear a story, uh, NPR, WBZ. And earlier today, they were talking about the ticketing in um, Chicago and the rates of bankruptcy of Chicago residents uh, from uh, traffic tickets, parking tickets, things of that like. S was it 10 years ago or several years ago, it was 1,000 people who had filed for bankruptcy. Recently, the numbers are now up to 10,000 people who have filed for bankruptcy due to uh, ticket, ticketing in Chicago. 
if one were to just not then ask the question, what are the what's the the what are the races that are impacted? Like, what is the race of the average person who's in that ten thousand? What neighborhoods do they live in? Um, what are their ages? Where are these tickets actually happening at what time? Then we could just say we need to impact. We need to change the the ticketing thing for the whole city of Chicago. Sure, we need to do that. But it, if we don't ask questions about where people are being targeted, where these people live, what are the racial backgrounds of these individuals, then we actually will not develop effective policy. We actually won't, because we're missing the point that actually, disproportionately, it is black folks in Chicago, based on the report that I heard this morning, disproportionately black people are impacted um, by bankruptcy uh, due to tickets in Chicago that are related to ve vehicular violations or whatever. And so we use data within context. We place context around data and then we then add story to data, right? So we knew that um, we, 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 the Malcolm X, grassroots movement, Malcolm X grassroots movement found uh, several years ago that every 28 hours a black person was killed um, by a police officer or a self-appointed vigilante or, or a security uh, officer. And we can know that. That's really important. That's, that, that data point has been super useful. And then we want to know where are those killings happening? Who are they happening to? Will body cameras solve the problem? No, they won't. But adding stories to what actually, who is Sandra Bland? Who is Trayvon Martin? Who is Rakia Boyd? Right? Right here in Chicago. Then sto you adding story to data allows us, that's what people connect to. People connect to story. Story allows us to actually mobilize people, identify shared values, and engage people in long-term change making. And not just change for change's sake, but to actually transform the world that we live in. So that's how we approach data. What are your thoughts on the Parkland students organizing for gun control and how it connects with organizing locally here in Chicago? To Parkland students, fuck it up. You know what I'm saying? Like, turn up. <laughs> like, turn up. Um, all day. Uh, I'm, I'm in support of these young people uh, making demands um, and involving themselves in organizing. What I, how I think it's connected to Chicago is actually what's missing in the dominant narrative and how they're being supported. Because in the past six years, young black people, young uh, uh, black students, literally, I'll just talk about here in Chicago, the diet hunger strike, y'all, where people were willing to die to keep a high school open on the south side of Chicago, did not receive this level of attention or support, not even just from people in Chicago. Right? I'm not talking, and Oprah, Oprah, you know, used to call this place her home. But that happened right here. There are students right now in uh, fighting to keep open public schools in Inglewood. Right? They just had an action at um, the mayor's house uh, last week. So it is absolutely connected. The problem is that when young black people or black students, period, one of our members, Jonathan Butler in D.C., he was the Mizzou student who went on a hunger strike at Mizzou, he's one of our leaders now, uh, deserve the same amount of support. We deserve the same amount of support and we do not receive it. We do not. And I had my little feelings hurt the other night when Oprah tweeted, I support you, like, yes, George in the mall, she was speaking of George Clooney, I'm donating $500,000 to the March for Our Lives. These young people remind me of the Freedom Riders. And I was like, wow, Oprah, where were you five years ago? Where were you five years ago? When literally, and I'm, I'm also not saying these things as an intellectual exercise, I was there, not as long as everyone else. I saw the tanks. I went through the checkpoints in Ferguson, in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in Charlotte, and Chicago. Personally, personal experiences with these things. Where was Oprah? Where was George Clooney? Where was Amal Clooney? I don't think she took his last name, thank goodness. But <laughs> she has more money than him, anyway. <laughs> um, but where were these people? Where was the media support? If I had $100, I'm going to say $100, for every time a media 
person, a reporter, asked me about, well, how do you feel about the violence uh, and the property destruction in Ferguson? Why are these young people acting like thugs? Why are they destroying their communities? We'd be able to fund the movement, you know? And so that's the connection, is that there are young people fighting every day for education and the right to receive their education in safe conditions. But when we are talking about black students and even brown students, right, who don't attend majority white schools, they don't get the same type of support. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.